if there's one thing I know and know so bloody well how to do, it's piggyback off someone else's success. I mean, I'm doing it right now, in fact, taking a lovely list penned by Michael Sidgwick and butchering it with my bleach-riddled tones. And what's this? A list that is also about wrestlers who got the bump up the ladder by riding other people's coattails? Oh, what a coincidence! I kid, we all work equally hard here to bring down the quality of our videos to well below the average. However, let's put down the joke regurgitator and actually state that while this list implies that some of these wrestlers weren't that great, it's far from the truth. It's just that one of their members or another talent gave them a boost that they otherwise wouldn't have got on their own. So with this in mind, and with Sidgwick's words in front of me, I'm Jules the Vulture of What Culture, and these are the 10 wrestlers that piggybacked their way to success. Number 10. Brutus the Barber Beefcake Bruti, as he was affectionately known to Gorilla Monsoon, was pro wrestling's atypical lapdog, following Hulk Hogan around like he was pretty much on a leash. And that's not a critique, he knew what worked for him, and he worked it well. Yet, it wasn't always the case, as he'd gotten into a prominent position within the company because of his brilliantly goofy gimmick of cutting people's hair with his oversized shears. Now, people would scream in joy when he bested one of the heels and lopped off their locks, but as time went on and he moved to WCW, it was clear that his gimmick was his appeal, as was his friendship with the Hulkster. The WWF also barred all use of the barber gimmick in WCW, so Brutus decided to use, well, what appears to be every other gimmick go. Going. He tried his hand at a straight-laced wrestler, a weirdly monosyllabic contrarian, and, well, the Booty Man, all of which failed miserably. Hell, the Booty Man actually got more over than he did because the WWE thought to plagiarize it. Number 9. Steve Mongo McMichael Steve Mongo McMichael, a proto-meme of a professional wrestler. And he wasn't that good, but he was accidentally really funny, so he did have that going for him. They say that every pro wrestler on the planet can and does do a suicide dive, but Michael could not. In one of several gifts that we're probably showing you right now, Mongo's efforts were like a carefully considered dismount more than anything. However, it's not like the man wasn't a powerhouse, because before his time in the ring, he'd had a football career of considerable renown, and it made him a very attractive prospect to WCW who snatched him up. However, it wasn't so much that the company piggybacked off of his previous success, it was that his poor transition between the two sporting fields meant that they had to use the brand value of the then fading four horsemen just to get him up to scratch. The faction was once the baddest men in the business, and with Mongo, well, it was just a bit bad full stop. Number 8. Virgil Virgil's entire career could be called a piggyback, seeing as he managed to flow from role to role across multiple promotions, all of which seemed in some way to be influenced or trailing behind others. His most famous as the Million Dollar Man's bodyguard is an obvious one, and the eventual turn on Ted DiBiase was met with a rapturous pop because he had taken this subservient position for so long while the Million Dollar Man rose through the card. Yet Virgil went on to piggyback off of Vince McMahon himself after his WWE departure, arriving in WCW as Vincent. It was a weird attempt to mock Vince, seeing as Vincent barely wrestled, but if it made them laugh, then so be it. It was a rather fitting move, as Virgil enjoyed a career comprised almost entirely of banter, and famously asked anyone who ribbed him on a Reddit AMA for money, even claiming that for $100, he'd dress up as one of the user's fathers and tuck him into bed. Number 7. Horace Hogan Success is relative in a list like this, because it's not exactly possible to reach the absolute pinnacle of pro wrestling purely by hanging around with the correct people, unless of course you are Triple H, but more on him later. Horace Hogan, the nephew of Hulk, experienced a degree of success in WCW, but prior to that he used a familial connection to land a gig in New Japan Pro Wrestling under the name of Axe Boulder, which sounds like a double dragon boss when you think about it, doesn't it? He even wrestled in ECW under the ring name Prey of the Dead, which was ironic considering the minimal life the crowd had for his antics. Nevertheless, he was a convincing, if thoroughly unremarkable, bruiser in FMW. But it wasn't until he became Horace Hogan in WCW and the world was made clear on his relation to the Hulkster that he got his biggest push. I mean, how could you not when standing next to that mahogany iceberg? Number 6. Road Warrior Animal It's impossible and unfair to criticize Road Warrior Animal without first putting him over as one of pro wrestling's most awesome badasses. As a team, 
team, the Road Warriors, were unlike anything else. They were legit hardmen, absolutely no selling shredders. They supported each other, which made it all the worse when substance abuse split them apart, leaving Animal to have to strike out on his own. And it's here that the critique comes in, as Animal jumped ship to WCW and was thrust into the main event in a manner that some would call undeserving, as it lent heavily on the power broker that was, at the time, John Laurinaitis. The older, less mobile animal meandered through the tedious catastrophe that was Sin's main event before resurfacing in WWE because head of talent relations Big Johnny got him the gig. There, Animal was saddled with his second goofy inanimate object in Heidenreich, sullying the great name of the Legion of Doom before somehow embarking on an even more abysmal singles run. A real shame. Number 5. The Nasty Boys The Nasty Boys were a great stiffer sh tag team act in their day, visibly disgusting, loathsome creatures wearing iconic eye-catching gear. Brian Nobbs and Jerry Sags lived the gimmick and fought their matches equally as hard. Their killer Chicago street fight match with Cactus Jack and Max Payne at WCW Spring Stampede 1994 repulsed and captivated a fan base unfamiliar with such wild brutality. At this point, the Nasty Boys were amazing, but then all of a sudden, they weren't. Their WCW run, in which they rocked the last good War Games attraction, ended following an infamous shoot incident with the Outsiders. So, after years of letting their skills rust and age, Hulk Hogan thought it best to bring them back to TNA, which was such an ego trip at the time that even Shane McMahon would call it self-centered. The run was as baffling as it was dire, yielding slower than snot sliding down a window action, and was another example of why people were starting to make fun of TNA at this point. And things were made all the worse when they were released following an ugly incident with a Spike TV executive. It was a helping hand that brought them a few more matches, but it could only have been described as, well, nasty. Number 4. Buff Bagwell Buff did indeed seem to possess the stuff in the early 1990s as a somewhat charismatic babyface prospect, but he happened to have Too Cold Scorpio as a tag team partner. This helped him enormously because Too Cold Scorpio was an incredible, innovative performer who masked Bagwell's inconsistencies. To make a modern comparison, think of Bagwell as the proto Enzo Amore, a hyper-arrogant performer who, if you were to remove the wrestling component, actually got over as the result of being a massive, well, knob. He was a pure narcissistic pleasure who regularly laughed at his own jokes with such vigor that it fooled a lot of people into thinking that he'd be the next big thing. He wasn't. When he was removed from the act, he was less mojo and machismo and more mojo rawly and cheese, yo, shut up, whatever. And he basically came to resemble an empty catchphrase generator. I know what that's like, mate. He was a great sidekick, but a main event vacuum. However, he still got praised by Vince Russo to be more charismatic than The Rock. Sure, Vince. Sure. Number 3. Garrett Bischoff now we enter deep into the realm of nepotism with the inclusion of Garrett Bischoff. Now, while pro wrestling history is so littered with nepotism that it warrants a list of its own, Garrett is an extreme case because his dad wasn't some super worker of the ring themselves. His dad wasn't true and blue grafted your way from the bottom up eating pinfalls for breakfast and rest holds for tea. Now, his dad was Eric Bischoff and he got an ungodly push on his arrival from none other than Hulk Hogan. Much like your mum, the Hulk said to the crowd, of gawking onlookers, everything you've given to me, I want you to give to him. And they did, because no one questions the man behind Pasta Mania, and also, yes, that was my one per list. Worse still, they marketed Garrett like he was some sort of badass, but he looked about as threatening as wet toilet paper. He even once tried to work Kurt Angle by having a ref hold him back, like he was a genuine threat to the Olympic hero. Bizarre. Number 2. Brooke Hogan but not as bizarre as this. Now, here's the thing. Sidgwick challenged me to read this entry verbatim, such as his distaste for the walking winner of Hulk Hogan's semen challenge, so here we go. <clears throat> Like Garrett, Brooke Hogan might belong on a different list, but she certainly didn't belong in pro wrestling. She piggybacked her way into it, and the tanning lotion applied to her buttocks by her father did not cause her to slip. She actually appeared in a major capacity on Impact Wrestling's TV show. Brooke Hogan performed for the crowd with an air of complete disdain towards them in a babyface role. And as furiously as Hulk tried to rub his talents off onto his daughter by way of her ass cheeks, this sadly did not happen. Brooke's line deliveries were wooden, reflecting the mahogany of the tanning lotion applied to her behind by her father, and her reaction shots were almost eerily artificial. She couldn't act at all, which was funny because poor Mike Tanay was instructed to put her debut over as a Lady Gaga-esque polymath, or more accurately, the second coming of 
Christ. Take a bow. From television personality to recording artist to movie roles, Brooke Hogan has accomplished so much in the entertainment business at such a young age, he said. Brooke looks beautiful, as usual, Taz said, sweating bullets in the face of the gun aimed at his temple. Jesus, Sidge. And number one, Triple H. Triple H made piggybacking an art form. Now, people tend to forget this, but Trips was not the be all and end all of wrestling that he posits himself as today, and he was less the king of kings and more of a pauper when he started out. He was definitely competent in the ring, but wasn't spectacular enough to elevate himself through talent alone. And it's here that the cerebral assassin truly earned his name, as he realized that the way to the top wasn't on the backs of others in the ring, but through making friends with the right people. Enter Shawn Michaels, who took a shine to the youngster. With perfect timing, Triple H became the best wrestler on the planet in the year 2000, and I use that in heavy quotation marks. And further on, his marriage to Stephanie secured his legacy. However, it wasn't just Shawn or Steph that helped him, Trips actually piggybacked on the entire independent wrestling scene in order to turn babyface in their eyes. He was now the corporate man who cared, a man who nurtures talent after systematically burying it for years when he was in the ring himself full time. It's clear his time of competition is fading, but my god, he was the best at working us all. To say that he piggybacked might sound truly negative, but to be honest, he was just extremely clever and knew exactly how to get what he wanted. And there we go, those were 10 wrestlers who piggybacked their way to the top. Let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. And you can follow me at RetroJ with a zero over on Twitter. And until then, I've been Jules, you've been awesome, never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye!